to end there. Okay. He just made he just made me the co-host. Okay. So I, my Zoom expires after 40 minutes and he has a Zoom that doesn't expire the session. <laughs> <laughs> so we are recording now. Uh, welcome to our first session, everyone. We, today we have Dr. Heather J. Kulik with us. I hope that's how you say it. Yeah. Uh, she's an associate professor of chemical engineering at MIT. Her work involves mainly using machine learning uh, in the prediction of material behavior and development of computational chemistry models to predict the behavior of complex systems um, like catalysts and enzymes. Uh, and today she is going to give us a brief overview of her research and her body of work. So Dr. Heather Kulik uh, did her bachelor's in engineering, in chemical engineering specifically from the Cooper Union in New York City. Afterwards, she moved to MIT for her PhD in material science and engineering um, under the supervision of uh, Professor Marzari, who is currently at EPFL. Is that right, Professor? Yeah. All right, I'm going, I'm going all right, because I'm using my memory for this. And uh, after that, she moved to um, Lawrence Berkeley for a year, working in the, under the supervision of Professor Felice on uh, ab initio dynamics. Uh, and afterwards, she moved for a postdoctoral uh, for a postdoc under the supervision of Todd G. Martinez, who is at Stanford currently. Uh, then she joined in 2013 MIT as an as an assistant professor, and she's currently the associate professor. Uh, she's she's currently an associate professor there. And uh, Dr. Heather has won several awards and uh, some good amount of funding during her career. Uh, and we're really really excited to have her here. I'm pretty nervous too because this is the first session I'll admit to that. You did a great job, it's no problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, so thanks thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that my group has um, done and engaged in in the, in the past uh, eight or so years. And it came from this motivation of, of thinking about complex material spaces. And in particular here, I'm showing you a visual of open shell transition metal complex space. And um, so if we tried to imagine studying experimentally or computationally all of these materials, it would be really hard to imagine tackling all possible materials. We can zoom in a little and maybe we don't want to study all possible materials. Maybe we just want to identify the one uh, molecule that's the best catalyst or maybe the one that's the best first uh, redox couples for energy storage or maybe the one that has the most exciting photophysical properties. Um, and in particular, it would be useful to know how to design these molecules atom by atom. For instance, if we take a look at one of these structures, how can we accelerate this exploration process so that we can actually start to build up and a know how of how these molecules should be built from the ground up? Because what computational chemistry has historically been really great at in the past 10 or 15 years is an experimentalist comes to us and says, I have this system, can you please explain to me how it works? And we're really great at explaining to researchers, okay, this is, this is how it works and this is why it works the way it does. But accelerating discovery, identifying new materials is, uh, is, is less, a less well-established role for computational chemistry. And so in particular, if we're interested in the spin state of the transition metal complex, maybe the metal center matters a lot. Maybe the uh, atoms coordinating the metal matter a lot. Maybe it's the overall structure that matters most. And we want to build a language that tells us atom by atom which parts of the molecule matter the most. Um, and why does this matter from an engineering perspective? Well, when it turns out and you think about what are the most interesting and atom economical and selective catalysts, these are homogeneous catalysts or emerging MOF catalysts, which uh, have um, this same kind of structure of a metal center with organic bits around that tune the behavior of the metal. Same goes for things like energy storage and gas separation. So this, this motif of being able to design a metal center in its coordinating environment to tune the properties um, is, is a very rich and, and fertile ground to think about being able to design materials. So this idea of building molecules atom by atom is not new and having a language to describe how molecules behave is not new. 
a lot of this was well established 20, 30 years ago in the organic chemistry community. There are lots of tools like smile strings uh, that can tell us how to compactly store a whole chemical structure in a simple uh, string of letters. There are low cost force fields and semi-empirical theories that do a good job of describing these organic molecules. There's, although it's not all of chemical space, there are large databases of multi-million uh, molecule uh, fragments all stored in smile strings that we can explore. And we can exploit concepts of molecular similarity to pick out only the say thousand most interesting complexes from this multi-million molecule size database. And if we take these same tools though, and try to apply them to open shell transition metal chemistry, we run into roadblocks at every turn. So for instance, even if we had a smile string for a transition metal complex, we would need to know how to address sensitivity of that structure to the oxidation and spin state. Uh, force fields and semi-empirical theories routinely fail in open shell transition metal chemistry and DFT is really the lowest rung we can afford uh, to explore the space. And the types of uh, databases we have access to are things like the Cambridge Structural Database, which largely just tells us what materials and molecules experimentalists have been really excited about in the past. And for instance, we can get, uh, we can determine that there have been a lot of porphyrins studied, but it's not gonna tell us what the next porphyrin should be. And then finally, concepts of molecular similarity, if we just blindly apply them from organic chemistry, they will fail to understand relationships that are more complex in transition metal chemical space. So we took a divide and conquer approach and the divide and conquer approach was motivated by this observation um, that a lot of a transition metal complex is actually organic in nature. And there are tools that work really well for organic chemistry that we can apply to the organic parts and then make up the difference where we really need to worry about that metal ligand bond. And so in particular, if we look at this progression of organic molecules from triple bond to single bond, we can see that a force field in the blue dots does a really good job of predicting the change in bond length from a triple bond to a single bond. So every part where we have an organic uh, bond to worry about, we'll use an organic force field and we'll trust it. Whereas for the metal ligand bond in an iron hexacarbonyl complex, just changing the spin and the oxidation state without changing the um, without changing the molecular structure at all, dramatically changes the bond length between the metal and the carbon atom, even more than we change from a triple bond to a single bond. And the force field can only predict one of these points. And it's not even the point the force field's trying to predict. So what we did was we took it in its first incarnation, a database of DFT values of those metal ligand bond lanes and used it to automate the command line structure generation of all of these transition metal complexes which brought high throughput screening to open shell transition metal chemistry where there hadn't been any high throughput screening before. Um, and then we could also do things like exploit concepts of similarity to, on the organic ligands and search through those multi-million molecule databases I mentioned uh, for candidate ligands to recombine into new transition metal complexes. Now, everything I described is in our open source code, Mol Simplify. There's a light version on the web interface that you can play around with. Um, as well as on Conda and GitHub, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, so I'm not gonna talk too much more about Mole Simplify and its features, but just keep in mind that it's the glue that holds together everything that, uh, that I'll talk about today. And so what this tool allowed us to do is it allowed us to go out and explore what I like to call chemical space neighborhoods. We didn't necessarily get to the vast chemical space universe I showed you on my first slide, um, but where I would have been satisfied in my PhD with running five calculations and then identifying a trend, my own students and postdocs could routinely study 200 to 500 catalysts with high throughput screening with density functional theory. And what we consistently found was across both functional materials and catalysis, we consistently found ways to break prior expectations and heuristics people had developed just by simply searching a slightly larger chemical space than would normally be searched in typical screening studies. And so I'm going to focus in on the one in the top right corner here, uh, which is related to catalysis for methane to methanol. Um, and so biological systems can carry out uh, conversion of 
of methane to methanol. And they do so typically by uh, first forming a high valent iron for oxo intermediate um, through some type of oxidant. Um, and then that iron for oxo can abstract a hydrogen from, from methane in a step we call hydrogen ion transfer. Then there's usually a barrierless rebound step to form methanol, which then needs to be released. And I'm simplifying this process a little. There could be other intermediates in play. But what we would usually say as chemists is that favoring the oxo formation step makes a really stable iron for oxo that then doesn't want to react and doesn't want to carry out the hydrogen atom transfer step. Chemical engineers have, math, have made a mathematical framework for this uh, that is widely used, and these are called scaling relations, which tell us simply that there's a linear relationship that the higher energy the oxo formation is, the lower energy the hydrogen ion transfer is. And why this is useful is because we can actually put into a kinetic model all of the different um, relationships between all of the steps, and we can come up with a prediction of the turnover frequency. And in this volcano plot, as it's called, we can write down one single descriptor on the x-axis that tells us how active our catalyst is going to be. And so what we want are the catalysts sitting at the top of this volcano plot. But if those uh, catalysts are, for instance, the, the um, the most precious metals or they're really hard to synthesize, then that's bad news, right? So it simplifies our screening rather than uh, studying many different catalyst reaction energetics and transition states. We can just screen for one descriptor, but this also tells us there's limited flexibility in the possibilities of how we can populate the top of this volcano plot. So while this is well established in heterogeneous catalysis, especially with bulk metals, we were interested to know if this still applied to the same degree in molecular catalysis. So we created 540 model catalysts, and we did this by taking a metal center iron two high spin, and we stretched and compressed the metal ligand bond. We also distorted the metal in and out of the plane. Um, we changed the atoms that coordinate the metal, and we changed the termination. And these were then later compared in this paper to what experimental uh, catalysts actually look like, but here we were just creating model environments. Um, and I mentioned that we were able by doing these screens to explore, uh, to, to you know, go against intuition and break heuristics. And so in, in this case, my intuition told me that the most important thing we could do to really disrupt these scaling relations would be to stretch and compress the bond because there are relationships in heterogeneous catalysis about uh, lattice strain and how lattice strain alters uh, properties of catalysts. And so I thought that's the main thing a big bulky catalyst is doing is stretch and compressing the bond. And so the spoiler alert is, of course, I was wrong. Um, so, so not only did we prove others wrong, but definitely we proved our own intuition wrong. Um, but overall, you can see that there's a lot of scatter in the data. Um, so I don't feel comfortable drawing a single straight line through this data. There's definitely a general trend that uh, making oxo formation more favorable makes HAT less favorable. Um, but we wanted to understand why there was so much scatter in the data. So we go first coloring all of our points by the atom coordinating the metal. And we can see that as we strengthen the ligand field going from oxygen to phosphorus, um, we move along the line. So we make uh, oxo formation more favorable and HAT less favorable. This has since been observed also in MOF catalysts. Um, and then we can focus in on just the oxygen coordinating catalyst and we start to see a line structure emerge. Um, and so here is what I predicted to be the most important effect, the metal ligand bond length. And it turns out all that does is by stretching and compressing the bond, we're just tuning the ligand field strength. Um, but if we go in the other direction, um, we can see that the three lines are actually differentiated by how much the metal is distorted out of the plane. And in fact, this is a general observation. So we can now color uh, all of our data by the metal ligand plane dihedral, how much uh, the metals distorted out of the plane. And here, at least now, the data is still scattered more than experimental data would be. Um, but I'm comfortable drawing three lines through this data. And you can see this gives us an opportunity to win at hydrogen atom transfer without losing at oxo formation. So it's relatively easy to disrupt or to move between scaling relations in homogeneous catalysis. Um, and while I showed this first uh, for, for iron two high spin, we actually find that 
um, when we change the metal and oxidation state as well, we actually see very different slopes between those two steps and very different trade-offs between oxoformation and HAT. And this, it, there's no one way to write down a, um, a single global scaling relation for these two steps in single site catalysis. Uh, the literature line in TAN that I'm showing is, is what people had previously written down as the relationship between these two steps. Um, but what we actually observe is that some metals have a steeper scaling relation, some metals in oxidation states have a shallower scaling relation. Um, and this also extends to other emerging areas of catalysis, such as single atom catalysts um, that reside in a totally different uh, space in terms of the trade-off of hydrogen atom transfer versus oxo formation. Um, the elephant in the room is that we've been doing all these calculations with a single DFT functional. Choosing a DFT functional can influence our predictions. Um, but what we were able to confirm is that while the overall energetics move around when we change the amount of uh, hard tree fock exchange in the functional, for instance, which is one of the biggest impacts we can have on our method, um, the general observation that a single scaling relation doesn't apply still holds. And so what this suggests is that there are many opportunities to tune molecular catalysts beyond that we could observe in heterogeneous catalysis, but it also means that we need to carry out a lot more calculations to understand what the trends are. Um, and so what we can quickly conclude is that we're never gonna get to this big picture chemical space universe uh, that I mentioned earlier, if we are only doing high throughput DFT. So we need something faster than high throughput DFT. Um, transition metal complex space is vast in part because we're taught all of the different knobs that we have to tune that I've been talking about. For instance, changing the spin on the metal center, uh, choosing a different metal. Each metal has a number of accessible oxidation states. Um, and so we could conclude we might like to um, build a machine learning model to accelerate the search through new materials. Um, but what I can tell you is that since our goal is to discover new materials that our models haven't seen before, and we want to do this in transition metal chemical space, um, we have distinct choices that we need to to choose in terms of thinking about how much data are we going to generate, what type of model complexity do we want to have, and, and how do we want to represent our chemical problem to our model. These are really three trade-offs you always have to think about when building a machine learning model, but our particular choices are, are distinct um, because of our goal of discovering new materials. Um, and so this first started as a, as a homework project for John Paul Genet when he was a first year grad student. Um, and he came to me and he said, I have a machine learning homework problem. What would you like me to be able to predict? And so I said, um, let's predict the quantum mechanical ground state spin of each molecule since we know that vastly Im impacts the properties. And I'd like to know the spin splitting, the energy difference between the ground state and the next uh, excited state. Um, and then because we're going to be using DFT training data, um, I'd like to know how sensitive that prediction is to the exchange correlation functional. And then I'd also like uh, us to not use any geometric information. I'd like us to predict the metal ligand bond length because I mentioned that we have MolSimplify already and MolSimplify uh, uses a DFT lookup table to predict the metal ligand bond length. And then the spoiler alert is that despite the fact that I gave this very tall wish list of properties to John Paul, um, it worked. And then once it worked, we readily extended it to other properties such as redox potentials, uh, band gaps, uh, reaction energies, and so on. And so we used a modest data set of octahedral transition metal complexes with common ligands, metals in multiple spin and oxidation states. And we addressed the DFT sensitivity question with uh, varying the hartree fock exchange fraction in its first incarnation. I'll show you some extensions beyond that in a couple of slides. And the main thing to note is that we worked with very diverse molecules in a relatively modest data set size. In comparison to the machine learning data sets many people work with, with organic molecules, we are working with much bigger molecules. And as a result, the number of points we have are, is much smaller. So where we really focused our attention was thinking about how are we going to optimally represent our transition metal complexes to a machine learning model. So in the in the top plot, um, what I'm showing is is how people typically were representing um, molecules to machine learning models when we first got into this. They would give the very intuitive thing of thinking about where all the atoms are and what their chemical identities are. 
But there are a lot of heuristics in transition metal chemistry that largely throw most of that information away, instead focus only on what's coordinating the metal directly. So we had an idea that something balancing between these two limits is probably the right thing to do in order to uh, in order to optimally represent our transition metal complex uh, to, to a machine learning model, really emphasize what's going on near the metal. Um, so we did this two ways, and I'm showing both ways because both worked. Um, one is we sat down and we picked out uh, properties very local to the metal, such as the metal and the coordinating atom identity and the electronegativity of atoms near the metal. Um, and we pick those out one by one based on my intuition or based on a guess um, in an ad hoc fashion. And if those properties correlated at all to our data, we kept them using something known as lasso. But you can imagine this very metal local feature uh, set misses out on things that might depend on the overall structure of the molecule, such as uh, properties that depend really strongly on the number of atoms in the system. And even then, uh, between those two limits, there's a clear gap in terms of how um, these properties um, these properties don't span this sort of mid-range. So we wanted to have a much more systematic way of developing uh, these descriptors. And so we went back and we did this a second time and we developed something we call revised autocorrelations or RACs. Uh, these are extensions of moreau brodo autocorrelations. They're products and differences on the molecular graph of heuristic properties. And we either zoom in and focus on the metal or zoom in and focus on the, the ligand um, and expand these, uh, these properties outward. Um, and the heuristic properties we use are um, nuclear charge or electronegativity, covalent radius topology and identity. If um, you'll see in a couple of slides, if it's an electronic property such as nuclear charge or electronegativity, I'll color it blue. If it's topology or identity, I'll call it yellow. Um, uh, the thing to note about this is that these properties in particular all come from a lookup table, so they don't require any pre-computation. Um, we can just get them on the fly. And some of these racks, by definition, only encode information close to the metal, we'll call those proximal. If they encode information far from the metal, we'll call them distal. Um, and all of the racks have an analogous uh, MCDL25 descriptor. So for instance, the zero depth metal centered Z rack is the metal identity and so on. Um, so if we carry out a dimensionality reduction using principal component analysis um, in, in a whole molecule representation, we can see why we wanted to develop these new representations. So here I'm showing you two molecules that are very far apart because they have a very different number of atoms in them, uh, 37 versus 151 atoms, but they have very common uh, similar metal coordinating atom uh, environments. As a result, the adiabatic high spin, low spin splitting, one of the properties we want to predict is very similar for these two complexes. If we instead look at a uh, metal local representation, um, like the one I'm showing here, uh, one of the representations we developed, then the two points are much closer together in the reduced dimensionality space. And so as a result, it's much easier for a machine learning model to figure out to predict that these two molecules behave similarly. As a result, on the same data set size, the whole molecule uh, error um, is an order of magnitude lower when we use one of our local representations. And what we can do is we can now predict faithfully the quantum mechanical ground state spin, at least according to DFT. We can do this either with the ad hoc feature set MCDL25, or we can do it uh, with uh, RAC155. Now RAC155 by definition includes lots of non-local information just based on how the expansions work out. But what we can do is we can apply feature sec selection that I'll elaborate on a little more in the next slide um, to pick out only the most important RAC features. Um, either for the specific property or for a series of properties. And the result is that all of those rack subsets largely predict uh, the quantum mechanical spin splitting to around one kilocal per mole accuracy, MCDL25 to about two and a half kilocals per mole. And the thing to keep in mind is that these are calculations that would normally take us hours to days. And so instead we can now from a machine learning model, in this case, a neural net, um, get a prediction uh, within around a second that's within one kilocal per mole of the DFT result that would have taken hours or days. So this is a really valuable way to think about exploring uh, chemical space. 
Um, and we can also do things like use the neural net to predict metal ligand bond lanes. We can do that to an order of magnitude less error than we had in the force field I was showing you on my first slide. But you might wonder why is it that MCDL25 is performing so much worse than the RACs? Um, and so here I'm grouping the, the features um, and showing how, in fact, yes, MCDL25 is very focused on what's going on at the metal and throws away most of the distal information. By definition of how the rack expansion works, um, a lot of the features are non-local when we first start out with the full rack 155 feature vector. Um, and when we apply feature selection to get the URAC26 feature set, what you can see is that the two URAC26 is now the same dimensionality as MCDL25, and they both agree that metal distal information is not very important, but where the two differ is in how much intermediate mid-range effects matter in the URAC feature set. And these were simply effects that we knew might matter, but had a hard time thinking about how to encode them in features. So this systematic approach gives a more rigorous way to identify what matters most for predicting a property. And just predicting properties faster is not necessarily very exciting in itself. We want to be able to do what I mentioned at the start of my talk, which is design new materials atom by atom. Um, and so here what I'm showing is an abstraction on a porphyrin of the most essential features to predict a property, which we uh, choose by carrying out a random force pre-ranked recursive feature addition into a kernel ridge regression model. Um, and here I'm going to color the atoms blue if electronic properties matter more, yellow if geometric properties matter more, and I'm going to make the atom large if it's important in the prediction and small if it's unimportant. Um, so here I'm showing two different uh, spin splitting feature sets. And what you can see is that this is recapitulating that ligand field theory works. So in particular, we see that the property of the metal and the atoms coordinating the metal are the most important. Um, and their electronic properties in particular matter most. Uh, where this gets interesting is when we contrast it with other properties. For instance, the metal ligand bond length is a much more overall uh, property. So it's not just the atoms participating in the metal ligand bond, but the overall structure and sterics and geometric factors that influence how long that metal ligand bond length will be. And then redox potential really emphasizes and lights up an entirely different part of the molecule. Um, so it, it's the geometric properties far away from the metal. And so this gives us a path to thinking about orthogonal design. We can tune the atoms close to the metal to alter the spin state and the atoms far from the metal to alter the redox potential. And so I'm gonna show this uh, throughout the rest of my talk in a slightly more quantitative fashion with these pie charts. The thing to know is if we see a lot of gray in the pie chart, that means non-local information matters a lot. If we see a lot of blue, red, and green, that means metal local information matters a lot. Um, so the elephant in the room is how much do these pie charts depend on where we get our data from? We got our data from a single DFT functional, um, but we might want to be able to get it from an experiment. We might wonder, you know, do these properties hold up if we had really accurate uh, data and, and so on? So there's lots of different uncertainties of how the machine learning model might have inherited the bias of our data. Um, so here's a pie chart for a BLIP GGA functional for uh, high spin, low spin splitting. And here are two other properties we contrast it with. So this is the homo lumo gap in the middle and then the vertical ionization potential at the bottom. Um, and so you can see the two lower properties are much more non-local in nature. This is very much in line with the redox I was showing you on the previous slide. Um, but what we want to know now is if we change the functional, do we change the pie chart? And so BLIP has a really weak correlation. So the properties, the raw properties correlate the weakest between BLIP and M06L uh, of the functionals we considered. In this paper, we studied 23 functionals. Um, but you can see that the pie charts are actually really consistent between the two functionals. Uh, so we see much more similarity as we go across the rows than as we go down the rows. Um, and so the same thing holds if we go to M062X, both M06L and M062X are so-called Minnesota functionals. They're very highly parametrized to reproduce experimental observations, including in transition metal chemistry. And M062X has more Hartree-Fock exchange than M06L, which has none. Um, and then PB0 double hybrid, this is a double hybrid that includes MP2 correlation in the long range. And as a result, um, it, uh, it uh, is expected to be the most accurate, but it also costs us a lot more to carry out 
PB0 double hybrid calculations than any of the other three functionals. Uh, so again, BLIP is a GGA, PB0 is a double hybrid. These really span uh, most of what's called Jacob's Ladder. Um, but you can see here what you notice is that the pie charts are really largely consistent across all of these functionals. And so rather than amplifying sensitivity to the functional, the carrying out this feature selection gives us a path to universal design rules. We can go out and we can collect the data for the pie charts at the low level theory and then use it to explore uh, chemical space. Um, with the high level theory only judiciously tuning the knobs based on the, the trends that we found at the lower level of theory. Uh, so now that I've hopefully convinced you that we're not too worried about where our data comes from, since it comes from DFT data, we're going to look at how do we actually start to tackle real world design challenges um, by exploring large chemical space universes. And so the first time we did this, we did this with redox flow battery redox couple design. And the design considerations for designing a redox couple um, are, are multiple. Um, a typical redox couple might be something like this vanadium ACA complex, uh, but to improve upon it, we want to address stability and resistance to crossover. So we don't want the molecule to be able to pass between the analyte and the catholyte. Uh, we need to address um, uh, making sure that this molecule is sufficiently soluble, um, as well as uh, has a high redox potential. So both of these matter in order to maximize energy storage. So we address the question of stability and resistance to crossover by choosing a candidate pool that would consist of very bulky structures that are synthetically accessible. And so we started with 38 common heterocycles from transition melt complexes. Um, we fused them together to form 779 candidate core bidentate ligands. We add functional groups that have the potential to tune solubility or redox potential, and we combined it with four metals. Um, and the result is that if you uh, multiply all these numbers together, you get 2.8 million bulky homoleptic transition metal complexes, all of which look totally different from anything we'd ever simulated before. Many of these have 100 to 200 atoms. So the hours to days that the calculations I mentioned earlier now is more like days to weeks. Um, so what we can do is we can do something called active learning. Um, and in particular, we're going to simultaneously optimize the solubility and redox potential using um, an active learning optimization algorithm that incorporates what's called uncertainty quantification. Um, and so on objective one and objective two, we're going to write down log P as a proxy for the solubility and then the redox potential. And we're going to go out and I'm, I'm showing this as a cartoon. I'll show this with real data on the next slide. Um, we're going to go out and collect as much DFT data as we can. We're going to train a neural net and ask the neural net, what do you think of this entire 2.8 million complex space? And what we're aiming to do is we're aiming to move past the Pareto front, which is the simultaneously best high redox and, and soluble complexes. So we ask the neural net to predict which points will lie past this Pareto front, and we'll use something called the 2D expected improvement criterion. which represents a combination of both uh, the likelihood of being past the Pareto front, as well as the uncertainty in those points, because the, we're going to collect these points and then use them to retrain the model. So these are the candidates, what the neural net thinks these points are, and the neural net will be more or less right about some of these points, um, leading to revised points that we can then reincorporate into our neural net and start again. Um, so this is what it looks like running full throttle on 64 GPUs after two weeks. This is how much data we have, um, in, uh, which is, is not very much at all. Um, but this is how much we had running from 64 GPUs on my cluster. Um, and then after about three minutes with the neural net, this is what we, we could see. Um, and so um, here is our Pareto front on both, both graphs. And so um, you can see the neural net with the expected improvement score is lighting up in one or two regions where it expects the greatest promise of going past the Pareto front, as well as um, uh, the most uncertainty of the model. 
Um, so we pick out points from that uncertain region and we carry out another week of DFT calculations. And you can see uh, the neural net wasn't that smart about the points at the Pareto front. Only some of them move the Pareto front forward. But we go back to the neural net again. We retrain it. And after another three minutes with the neural net, we have a new region that is expected to improve upon the Pareto front. And this time you can see uh, we do a lot better. After another week with DFT, we've pushed the Pareto front a lot for, further. Um, so we go back to the neural net. And you can see that the expected improvement scores are lowering. The, the neural net's getting more and more pessimistic that it can move past the Pareto front. Um, and so um, we do this a couple more times. And after about six weeks with DFT and five generations and 15 minutes with the neural net, we call it a day and we say, OK, this is good enough. Um, you know, one reason to stop this is that we'd saturate the Pareto front. The other reason is the student on the project needed to graduate, and that's as good a reason as any to stop one of these runs. Um, so interesting things to note are the final three generations make up the Pareto front. So nothing from the earlier steps made it onto the Pareto front. And there's really convergent design principles. If we want to optimize the redox potential with, with reasonable solubility, if we really care about that leg of the Pareto front, then um, these manganese high spin complexes with oxygen coordinating atoms and sulfur in the ring um, are really uh, valuable design motifs. And we want to keep polar groups that are small to maximize solubility without sacrificing redox potential. Um, so if you had asked me before, and which of these things could you have predicted, I probably would have been able to predict that small polar groups were essential for keeping up redox potential. Um, but otherwise, this uh, motif in particular was totally uh, new to us and new to the literature. So if we compare how we could have done this in a brute force fashion, just randomly searching through the space, um, we see that we have at least 500 fold acceleration. Um, and that's a conservative estimate. But when I first heard this, I thought, oh, 500 times faster. That's that's nothing. People do things 500 times faster all the time. Um, and that's until you realize it took us six weeks running in parallel with DFT and you multiply six weeks by 500 and you realize that this is the difference between having an answer to a design challenge in a month versus not in our lifetimes. Um, and so as an example, we can come back to the methane to methanol conversion that I talked about uh, where it took us months to run 500 calculations before. And here now I'm going to focus on two steps. So we know OXO and HAT are weakly correlated to each other, but we want to optimize our catalyst to be good at carrying out the hat step and to avoid over oxidation we also want the catalyst to release methanol after it's formed um, and we're going to search through a space of 16 million candidate catalysts that we stitch together from synthetically accessible fragments using a series of steps that reproduces things that are already well known in the literature such as porphyrins and corals but also creates new macrocycles um, and so here I'm showing on the x-axis hat and on the y-axis release. And so what we can do is we repeat the same approach we did for the redox flow batteries. And we can see that we can move forward the Pareto front identifying new catalysts that have favorable release uh, without having unfavorable hydrogen atom transfer. And the result is that, um, that we identify some new motifs, which include that having an anionic axial ligand is really helpful for facilitating uh, methanol release, and that uh, atoms that are not typically used in the coordinating environment of the metal in most common um, methane to methanol catalysts, such as phosphorus or sulfur, actually can lead to good catalyst reaction energetics. So finally, I want to finish my talk by telling you a little bit about how we can extend all of the framework that I've developed to periodic systems. And so the ma most natural cousin in periodic materials to what I've talked about so far is metal organic frameworks. Um, and a lot of the applications of metal organic frameworks are, um, are for gas separations and gas storage. So simply they're porous structures and people like to think about putting gas molecules in these structures for storage, uh, capture, or separations. And so a lot of the machine learning efforts in metal organic framework studies has been focusing on encoding the geometric properties of the MOF, in particular, how, how big and what size are the, the pores in the MOF. Uh, but what we've been working on is graph-based representations known as RACs that really throw away all that information and only encode the chemical structure. 
Uh, so we're interested to know um, if we could actually improve upon these typical machine learning workflows by incorporating uh, revised order correlations into MOS. And so here's a simple random forest model predicting how much uh, CO2 uptake is preferred by, by a material uh, trained only on geometric features. And then what we're going to do is we're going to design new racks specifically for metal organic frameworks. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to break down a moth the same way a moth chemist would break it down, which is we're going to define the domains such as the secondary building unit and define a rack scope over those that emphasizes the metal secondary building unit. We're going to take out the linker and we're going to compute racks for the linker. And we're going to look at functional groups on the linker and encode specific racks for that. And I've color coded everything here. So I've color coded the geometric features blue, the metal chemistry red, the functional groups green, and the linker chemistry purple. And I'll show you in a moment to what extent each of these components matter. But just to say, adding racks improves just these simple machine learning models. Um, and so now we, we can, in fact, actually better predict CO2 uptake when we add racks into our feature set. Um, but in analyzing what features are most important for making these predictions shows us when the chemistry matters the most. And I'm going to compare two molecules side by side now. So methane is a very uh, spherical molecule that is, is non-directional, whereas CO2 um, is a much more directional molecule. And so in fact, what we see is that metal chemistry really dominates CO2 uptake in the low pressure regime. Um, whereas geometry doesn't matter very much at all for either methane or CO2, but metal chemistry matters a lot more for CO2. Um, as we increase the pressure, uh, we can see geometry takes over and these other features matter a lot less. Um, but this still doesn't mean that we should disregard metal chemistry when we're thinking about design, because actually what we want to optimize is the working capacity, which is the difference between the low pressure and high pressure regimes. So overall, what we can see is that at high pressure, our feature analysis really uh, supports our intuition. At high pressure, we're just shoving molecules into the pore. And so what really starts to dominate is geometry. So these pictures are, are all nice and good, but uh, if we compare how these different pie charts show up for, say, CO2 uptake at low pressure, um, if we apply this on the core MOF data set, uh, which is a set of experimentally previously synthesized MOFs, if we compare it instead to hypothetical sets, which are these large sets of 100,000 MOFs that people hypothetically enumerate, you can see that conclusions are really strongly sensitive to where we get that data from. Um, and so we wanted to know why that was. Why is it that metal chemistry seems to matter more for experimental MOFs than they do for these hypothetical MOFs? Um, and so here I'm showing another dimensionality reduction, um, and I'm showing it in different subsets of features, either the pore geometry, metal chemistry, linker chemistry, or functional groups. And where you see gray peeking through, it means that there's an experimental point, but there's no analogous point in any of the hypothetical sets. And so what you can see is that of all of the four sets of features, it's only really the metal chemistry where the hypothetical sets lack the same diversity as the experimental sets. And so we can't predict that metal chemistry matters a lot and if we use hypothetical sets because there's simply just not enough diversity of the metal chemistry in those sets. And this applies to MOFs, but it's probably true for other spaces of materials. A really grand outstanding challenge for materials discovery is how do we make um, uh, how do we make sure that we encapsulate the diversity of experimentally synthesized structures while also going and discovering new materials? Um, and so what we wanted to do was first go back to this experimental set of MOFs that have all been synthesized because they've been synthesized, they've been characterized, there are structures that we can work with, and there are papers that were written about all of these different MOFs. Um, and so what we did was we featureized all the MOFs in this core MOF experimental data set. We downloaded all the papers we could. And then we looked at what are the types of properties that experimentalists report? What can we learn from these thousands of MOFs synthesized by hundreds and thousands of MOF researchers? And so the two properties we focused on were activation stability. So this is, can you remove the guest molecules? Can you remove the solvent from the, from the MOF when you heat it up? And the other was thermal stability. Can you heat up the material without loss of its structure? And these are two really important uh, properties to ensure robustness and stability of the MOF, for instance, for applications in catalysis. And so what we did was we then trained machine learning models directly on this experimental data. 
Um, so we have a classification model that predicts uh, activation stability, and we can analyze which features matter most. We also have a regression model to predict the temperature at which the material breaks down, and we can analyze uh, the features that matter most. Overall, uh, for both properties, linker chemistry really matters a lot, whereas heuristics in the literature had much more focused on what the metal center was doing. Um, and we can do things like make new predictions on MOFs we hadn't seen before, um, it orders of magnitude faster than the best alternatives. Um, and we, more importantly, we can use these materials to figure out how to engineer unstable MOFs into stable ones. So here I'm starting with um, a MOF that has low activation stability. That's the number shown in red. If it's zero, it's not stable. If it's one, it's stable. Changing the metal doesn't improve the stability, whereas our model would predict that the real uh, thing we need to do is remove that methoxy group from the linker. Um, and so when we do that, what we see is that we can get um, a high activation stability, whether we use the zinc or the calcium metal at center. Similarly, if we have a moth that lacks thermal stability, uh, we also, our model also predicts we want to change the chemistry of the linker by fluorinating it. And in doing so, we actually preserve the activation stability, but increase the thermal stability dramatically. And all of these predictions um, of our models, as well as all of the data we've curated, is available on a website, MOF Simplify. Um, it, you can make predictions with our neural nets on the fly to any MOF you upload. Um, it will also allow you to visualize the components of the MOF. Um, and one of my favorite features of, of this overall is that we also um, ask users to rate the predictions that we provide. Um, and um, we also provide information about where this MOF sits with respect to other data in our training set. And we encourage folks to upload new data or upload corrections where they see them. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd just like to conclude by telling you that we started with building the first tools for high throughput open shell transition metal chemistry. This naturally led us down the path of uh, machine learning model property prediction um, for transition metal chemistry, really the first models to predict open shell transition metal complex quantum mechanical properties. Uh, just predicting properties faster is not enough unless we can accelerate discovery of new materials. Um, and finally, the most important thing we can do is reveal design rules uh, that other people can use. Everything I talked about is in MOL Simplify or MOF Simplify, and I'd just like to finish by thanking the, the students who did the work. Uh, MOL Simplify was first built by Timmy Unidas, my first PhD student. John Paul Janay pioneered the, um, the machine learning work in my group, and I, a lot of the more recent work I've had the chance to tell you about was done by Adit Janandi and Chen Ruduan. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you uh, for such an engaging talk. And uh, I especially like the portion uh, that it's open source for anybody to use. And uh, that really uh, is a great feature about you know, science. And thank you for the wonderful talk. So the floor is open for questions. I have a few questions too, but it's not about me all the time. So I'm going to like somebody else ask first. So, so I think Dr. Zahir is an inorganic chemist in our department and he has a question for you. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question, Dr. Zahir? See if you can. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. And thank you, uh, Professor Kuri, for this wonderful talk. Uh, uh, it's raining outside, and I'm not sure that whether you are able to uh, you know, listen to me correctly or not. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I lead a, a research group here that uh, we design catalysts and uh, especially those uh, which are based on metal organic frameworks. Uh, and I was familiar with some of the work uh, done by Laura and Aditya on the you know, computational aspects of especially iron-based MOF uh, for the methanol, methane to methanol conversion. I was just wondering that in all those papers, I just saw that all these researchers just you know, focus on the metal nodes Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I think it's because the structure is quite complex and I'm not a computational chemist myself, but I assume that it would be really hard to, you know, do the uh, calculations in extended or framework structures with, you know, thousands of atoms involved. And in, it's in order to simplify the systems, I think they are limiting themselves to the secondary building units of the nodes. So uh, I... It, does your work on 
also focus on the any node part of the metal organic frameworks are you you know consider the extended structure uh, in your calculations so everything here is gas uptake characteristics which is uh which is the overall structure it depends on the entire structure of the moth so everything i'm showing here including the machine learning uses all of the moth it however uses features that include an emphasis on telling you when the, when the MOF SPU matters most versus when the linker matters most. Now to predict catalyst reaction energetics, um, it is trickier to do a DFT calculation on the entire MOF. And most of the time uh, folks have shown that the, the SPU model does a reasonable job in a lot of catalysis. Of, of recapitulating the energetics and the observed uh, catalytic rates. And that's why folks focus on that. Although people do investigate uh, the periodic structure when they can. Um, so all of our work involves the full MOF, but we have been doing um, a study where we specifically um, are searching through the literature, just like I've shown here, for MOFs that have never before been studied for catalysis, but have been made. And in that case, our initial screen uh, used um, used uh, the SBUs, and then we went back and we compared to periodic DFT. Uh, but the periodic uh, structures are always used in the gas uptake and storage and diffusion um, studies, both by us and by others. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Anyone? So Dr. Atta has a question. Dr. Atta is an experimental physicist in our department. Uh, Dr. Atta, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah. Uh, hi. Can you can you listen to me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Good. Uh, so a great talk again. So. Uh, so uh, great body of work. So a couple of questions about uh, the nature of this whole um, machine learning process which we're doing. So uh, you said that the Rex, uh, the Rex which you were working with is a local, uh, it has more weightage to, to the local effects rather than the, let's say the referral effects or so. Uh, so one thing is like how the weightage is done, like how do you scale up with uh, larger and larger scales? And the second question would be like, let's say you said that, okay, you, you can work out like uh, smaller molecules and you can scale up. Uh, would, uh, so the question is, and then you say it's a 500 fold enhancement, so you can scale up uh, the enhancement to similar way. Uh, my, my question is, uh, if you scale up the molecule, would, would other effect like topological effects comes into play as well, or the whole, like uh, something like that, and that which may, slightly change the nature of the problem if you scale up the molecular structure. So, or, or is just uh, once you work out a, a smaller molecule, it's, it's rather uh, trivial to, to scale up only the, uh, you need more time for that. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, so I, think, I think you asked a few different questions. Um, one thing is when we start with all racks, uh, yes. they have metal local information and metal non-local information. When we apply feature selection uh, mm -hmm. in kernel ridge regression models, uh, those tend to lead to us throwing away metal non-local information, especially for properties like spin or mm -hmm. magnetic moment, if you're more used to thinking it from a physics perspective. The, um, uh, when we do this in practice, for instance, you were asking a little bit about this system. Um, when we do this in practice, uh, we use a neural net and we let the neural net do the feature engineering. So what that means is if we have a property and a data set where only metal um, local information matters, then uh, the neural net's going to learn that relationship and going to throw away information far away from the metal. Um, this... Uh, this could be a problem if suddenly we encounter one point where its properties really strongly depend on metal non-local information and it was never in the metal. But in this active learning approach, if we encounter those points, then the model gets retrained and the model emphasis to be local or non-local can shift. So that's the advantage of this approach. Um, and I think the other thing you asked about with scale up is the 500 fold. It depends on the number of properties that we're optimizing. So if we optimize more properties, the acceleration would actually increase. It's approximately 
um, you know, it'd be up to a thousand or, or something like that. Um, in terms of studying larger molecules, that's not something uh, we've done because when we're at a point where we're studying 200 atoms, we're already at like the scale of the largest molecules in the CSD generally. But if we wanted to go to coordination materials or solid state materials, we'd probably adapt more from this MOF based approach we had used. Okay, I, great. Huh. I hope that so, answers your questions. Oh yeah, that's uh, to a great extent. So, so j just one thing. So, what's the input for how the how the uh, how the machine learning algorithm learns that whether the local is more important or global? Is it experimental input which it compares with, or is it uh, something else we would rely on? So, so for instance, here here this is uh, this data is all experimental. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this data is all experimental. This data is all DFT data, um, but what we showed in this paper was that changing the DFT functional doesn't change the answer, and I've cut it from this talk. Uh, yeah. But uh, here we also show that uh, using the consensus of the different DFT functionals recapitulates experimental data as well. Okay. Um, so, but so I didn't have a chance to talk about that. Okay. Okay. So, so this, uh, so the coming to this insensitivity, so or less sensitivity of the results to the mm. DF, DFT functional would choose. Wouldn't it be a, like a two-edged sword in the sense, like I mean, if it's insensitive, it might be hard to to reverse engineer the problem. Uh, or so, what we were able to show was that regions that uh, DFT functionals agree it's not guaranteed, but regions where the DFT functionals agree are actually the regions where DFT is doing a better job of predicting experiment. And we've more recently uh, looked at some, um, we've more recently looked at this closely and we've identified that a good indicator of sensitivity to higher uh, to level of theory comes from uh, DFT functionals disagreeing. It's actually a, a pretty good indicator. And so we've since looked at uh, graduating to higher and higher levels of theory, including coupled cluster, and being uh -huh. able to recommend, for instance, which DFT functional is going to be the most accurate. I cut all of that from there's, there's okay. not a okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, OK, great, great. Yeah, OK, uh, thanks. So one last question is from my side. So uh, so you, you said that this metal uh, uh, organic, so the bond length, uh, the stretching of the bond length might, like, this, this is what you play with. Uh, mainly. So the question is like, uh, what about other uh, other effect, like chiral effect of these uh, catalytic crystals, which which might comes into play and might have a role here. So are they taken into account in these calculations? Yeah. So I think you're referring back to this. These these are all uh, identical. There's there's no chirality in these catalysts. These are all identical metal uh, coordinating atoms, and so there's no chiral center. Um, chirality does come into play in some types of organic um, uh, catalysis, and we have thought about extensions to racks that can handle chirality. In their standard form, racks don't handle chirality though. So that's oh. that's. Question. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Uh, do we have any more questions? Anyone? If not, I will ask questions. All right. Uh, so I think hello. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Hello, Prof. Thank you. A very interesting talk. I have a few questions. Uh, first is that uh, in this in this uh, figure, so you have different transition states. So may I know, uh, uh, can, can your model predict these kind of states, transition states? And also on slide 13, you show different functionals. And uh, I couldn't see uh, a range separated functional and in which there's a, a good amount of dispersion. So may I know the reason why you've not chosen uh, these kind of functions? Um, so in, okay, so I'll answer the second question first, because that one's easy. So you can see we actually did 23 functionals for the sake of, um, for the sake of fitting time, fitting, fitting the talk in the time. Um, I cut most of that discussion. We pick four functionals that disagree the most from this set, but you can see we have double hybrids with uh, dispersion. We have range separate hybrids, uh, including the omega B97X has dispersion in it. Uh, all of the structures are actually taken from one functional. So dispersion, empirical dispersion is not going to alter the final structure. Um, but you can see all of our, 
in, in, in the SI, all of our conclusions are general to this 23 set of functionals. Um, we pick on BLIP and M062X because they disagree the most among all of the functionals, uh, but this is generally what you see when you compare the functionals. Um, so that's that's the, the second, uh, the answer to the second question. Could you remind me again what the, the first question was related to? Yeah, can, can the model predict the transition states? How many oh. states are? Yeah, so um, so in in uh, in the work that we did, this is not with with the model. Or I guess you're asking more about this. In this work, we exploit for hydrogen atom transfer. There's a really tight BP relation between the reaction energy and the transition state. And so, in principle, there's no reason to not predict the transition state. But in practice, we um, do our search on reaction energies and then go back and characterize the transition states. Um, we are thinking though about predicting transition states explicitly. They're just very time consuming. So to generate the training data is the hard part. Yeah, yeah, that, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so I don't think we have any more questions. So I have a few questions, Dr. Mm -hmm. so the first part of my question is uh, a realistic question. And the second one is a lofty, lofty goal. So, uh, and if uh, the first question, uh, I was reading this article that you wrote with uh, Stephen Whitlam. Uh, it, it was about electronic structure, as my memory serves me correctly, uh, in which you were mentioning this thing called quantum Monte Carlo dropout. So how relevant is that to networks and what kind of learning is the most efficient in training neural networks in these things? Um, so it's just Monte Carlo dropout, not quantum Monte Carlo dropout. And we've moved away from that quite a bit. I don't, I don't have a backup slide handy on that. Um, the uncertainty quantification that we use um, is actually, and that probably answers your second question about the efficient training. The uncertainty quantification metric we use, I apologize, I don't have the reference here, um, is a distance and latent space. And we found that to be a much more uh, advantageous way to identify where the model doesn't know something. And so what the distance and latent space is, is you take any new point and you compute its distance in the latent space, which is the last layer of the model, um, prior prior to prediction, and if those points are distant in latent space, then they um, they are points the model doesn't know anything about, and then you advantageously go and you acquire those new points and retrain the model. Um, I think the biggest outstanding question is how to what extent should you let the uh, model architecture um, change between um, between each uh, retraining. That, that I think we don't know. I mean, because um, as you acquire more and more data, the, the depth of the neural net will necessarily, um, it'll be better to have a deeper neural net. So, um, but, but the, the work I'm showing here, um, yeah, I, I don't have a chance to, I, I don't have a handy slide for it. Everything I'm showing here uses uh, distance and latent space as the uncertainty quantification. We previously used in the very beginning Monte Carlo dropout, um, and we found it was overconfident in predicting the points the model was most uncertain about. I see, I see. Uh, so the lofty uh, goal part of the question uh, is what I'm going to ask now. Uh, so if uh, these learning methods that you have developed, if we couple them to, uh, let's say the conditions that were uh, on, uh, that were described in a Harald Ure experiment. I hope you know about that, in which, uh, so essentially it talks about the origin of chirality in nature. So uh -huh. if we couple these learning methods to prebiotic conditions, mm -hmm. can you give us some answers to this very, very difficult question? What is the origin of chiral team nature? Because this is the question that really, really bothers me a lot. <laughs> it's it's not a question I've thought about. Um, uh, I definitely think you would want to adapt. Um, you would want to adapt some of the things we've been doing. You would want to develop generative models. Um, mm -hmm. You would want to develop uh, screening models. But you know, I I, I don't. Um, I think you could rediscover chirality with a machine learning model, but the reason why that model was able to discover chirality, I suppose then you would need to develop models, develop a, a way to interrogate the model to learn why it's learned what it has, I think I is one path. 
because with this, uh, with, with this big computing and machine learning methods uh, in the toolbox, uh, we can really, you know, attack that uh, very, very difficult question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just it's, this question has always bothered me. This is why I came to chemistry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's not one I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I see. I see. So I think we don't have any more questions. I would really like to thank you for doing this during the summer. I know you were very busy. So thank you so much for uh, giving us your time. And thank you. Good thank luck you. with your learning research. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Dr. Philip, can you stop the recording?